Well, good morning, Grassroots. Good, morning. good to see all of you here this morning. I want to thank all of you who were here last week and let me share a little bit about my dad. How many dads are in the room here today? Would you just raise a hand? How many of you want to be dads? Why are there three women holding their hands up here? Is it easier? It might be. Um, I, I love my dad. I love uh, who he is. I love that in my lifetime, dad always did the right thing. How many of you have ever heard that phrase, do the right thing? Yeah? Everybody should have heard that phrase at one time or another. I'm going to move this over. It's blocking my view. I, uh, I hear it all the time. You hear it in the news. Politicians are supposed to say it with me. Do the right thing. How many of them do? Zero. A few. Um, who else is supposed to do the right thing? Dads are supposed to do the right thing. We've already said that. How many moms, it's just automatic they do the right thing? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, who else? Business people are supposed to, say it with me, do, do the, right the right thing. thing. Have you noticed that sometimes you see some people, a business person, a politician, a leader, a pastor, whomever, a teacher, and almost always they, say it with me, do, do the, the right, right thing. thing. And then there's the other side of the coin. You see this person, you know this person, and almost always they don't do the right thing. This is not a new concept, doing the right thing. It's as old as humanity itself. I would love to tell you that everybody tries to do the right thing, but that you already know it's not true. But there are a lot of people who do try to do the right thing. And this morning I want you to go with me back in time to a time when there were kings and kingdoms. And we're going to look at the life of a particular individual who almost throughout his whole life, say it with me, did the right thing. And his name is Asa. A-S-A. And you'll find the passage... In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, and it's actually three different chapters, three continuous chapters, 14, 15, 16. Thankfully for you, we will not be reading all of those chapters, but I will be pointing out certain verses. Now, his father was Abijah, and Abijah died. Everybody does. And his son, Asa, became the king. And it says in verse 1, chapter 14, there was peace in the land for 10 years. And verse 2 says, Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of his God. Now, in those days, they had a lot of different gods. We do too. Let's be honest about that. We have the God of money. We have the God of entertainment. Has anybody seen the new Jurassic Park movie? I loved it. I didn't scream. But I thought about it. We have different gods. We have the God of work, right? We have the God of possessions. We have the God of music, whatever it may be. We have lots of different gods in our world. But in those days... Their gods pretty much had some kind of a totem pole or a, a statue or something that represented those gods. And what was supposed to be done in this territory, in this kingdom called Israel, was that there was supposed to be only one god, it's the God that you know, the God of creation, 
the great and almighty and all-powerful God who loves you beyond comprehension. And so Asa did the right thing. And it goes on in there and it says that he removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. And he smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles, which are like totem poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, their God. Asa did what was right. How many politicians do you know? that do what is right. Don't, don't just blurt it out. But there are a few. Okay? There are a few. They may not be doing what you want. But I love it when somebody does what is right. Asa did that. He removed the altars and the shrines and the pillars and the foreign gods. And there's just one real simple question I have for us today. What are our altars? What are our pillars? What are our totem poles? What are the things that we put in place of God? What are the things that we need to move out of the way so that we can do the right thing and worship the only God? Asa did that. Now, that has some benefits. Asa told the people, let us build towns and fortify them with walls and towers and gates and bars. And in verse 7 it says this, look at this, the land is still ours. Why? Because, and you can insert here, we did the right thing. We sought the Lord our God and he has given us peace on every side. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. Do you know more wonderful things happen in times of peace than in times of war? We're able to build schools. We're able to teach music. We're able to celebrate. We're able to, to do great things when we're at peace and not at war. I recently watched a documentary on the Second World War and many, many, many beautiful buildings were in Europe, but not after World War II. They were destroyed. See, peace brings prosperity. War brings despair. And the land was theirs, and they prospered. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's always going to be peachy. In this case... King Asa had a pretty good army. It says here that he had 580,000 warriors in his kingdom. And if you switch down to verse 9, if you happen to have your app open, it says, Once an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked them with an army of 1 million men and 300 chariots. And what do you do when you're faced with overwhelmed odds? You've done the right thing. And, and that happens to us, by the way. Sometimes we've done the right thing, and we've done right by our families, and we've done right by our jobs, and we've done right by our city. And we've served, and we've cared, and we've, we've gone out of our way to do the right thing, and then we're faced with overwhelming opposition. Have you ever faced overwhelming opposition? I have. This is what was happening. They were completely overwhelmed, almost two to one, with this army that came at them. Well, here's what you do when you're faced with overwhelming opposition. You call out to the God who loves you. That's what they did. If you drop down to verse 11, it says this, Then Asa cried out to the Lord. Look at what he says. O oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against the vast horde. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. And I want to remind you of something. I don't know what you're going through, but I know that somewhere along life, all of us are going to face opposition. 
You deserve that promotion. You got passed over. You deserved that benefit that got voted down. You did the right thing with your boss, and he didn't pay attention to you. Did the right thing in your family, and yet tragedy still struck. These things will happen. Who do you cry out to? Cry out to the Lord. Ask Him for help. And here's what happened. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But basically, the Lord helped them win that battle and push the Ethiopians out. Realize that the Lord will fight your battles for you. Has anybody ever had that experience where you were just so overwhelmed that there was nothing you could do about it and still the Lord stepped in and made things right. Has that ever happened to anybody here? I see several hands. I'll tell you something. It's not easy to trust in the Lord that much. To say, Lord, I can't do this. I need your help. When he does step in, it's an amazing experience. There are always things that are going to be more powerful than you, that are coming against you. And the only power that counts is the power that the Lord has and he uses for his own people. Why does he use that power for us? Because he remembers that we do the right thing. We do the right thing. So here's what happens when you seek the Lord. You ready for this? This is, this is profound. The Bible says when you seek the Lord, you're going to find him. I was expecting a drum roll. I was expecting cymbals. That's it? I'm going to seek the Lord and I'm going to find him? What's that all about? Look at what chapter 15 has to say. It says in verse 2, The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. I know when we go through hard times, man, man, we are tempted to try to take things in our own hands. We are tempted to try to fix it ourselves. Are there any dads in the room? Because I know that's how I act. I'm always trying to fix it. But there are some times when you can't fix it, Dad. There are some times when, as hard as you try, you need help. The Lord will help you. The Lord will stay with you as long as as you stay with him. Sometimes we need that extra help. Sometimes after we've gone through something traumatic and the Lord has helped us and we begin to feel somewhat normal, which, by the way, that happens pretty quickly. We go through a really bad time. We go through a really traumatic time. And all we're trying to do is get back to normal. And when we get back to normal, we begin to forget what the Lord has done. The word here is that to remember the Lord is to seek Him. Search for Him. And in seeking the Lord, you will find Him. The Bible says the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with Him. As long as you keep looking for the Lord. I love verse 7. Verse 7 says, Be but as for you, be what? Strong and courageous for your work or, let's put in here, your seeking the Lord will be rewarded. I know it's tempting, especially in our modern age. Something goes wrong, what do we do? We go to the bank, we get a loan. Somebody gets sick, we go to the doctor. And I'm not saying anything against doctors. I love doctors, as long as I don't have to go. Um, but the last seems like the last resort is to pray the last resort seems to be that we seek the Lord and I guess what the Bible is trying to teach us here and what, what the Lord wants is for us to seek him first car breaks down seek the Lord first 
and he'll probably send you to Christian Brothers, but that's not <laughs> us. Some of you are laughing. That's not really funny. <laughs> Seek the Lord first. Seek Him every time. Keep seeking Him. Be strong and courageous. Don't give up. We might fail. We might have to be courageous enough just to keep going after we fail. Now, the Israelites went through a traumatic event. A million people came to wipe them out. They survived. They sought the Lord. And so the king, who is doing the right thing, Asa, leads them to make a covenant. How many of you know what a covenant is? A covenant is deeper than a promise. It's like a promise, but it's a promise with teeth in it. It's a promise that something is more important than just lip service. I'm going to commit myself to this. Anybody married here? Okay. Then if you've stood in front and made those vows, that's a covenant between a man and a woman. To love each other, to care for each other, take care of each other. But it, covenants can be much more widespread than that. And in verse... 12, I'm going to read just this little section here. Asa was hearing the words of the prophet, and he took courage, and he removed the idols, and he called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin, and he called for them to make a covenant. And in verse 12, it says, they entered into a covenant to do what? To seek the Lord. To do, say it with me. To do the right thing. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and with all their soul. And on down in verse 15, it says, They earnestly sought after the Lord. You have 15 on there, Marcus? Yes, sir. Look in your Bible there. It says, They earnestly sought after the Lord, and they found him. I love that. You know what encourages me? Is that I have a God that if I seek after him, he's not going to go away and hide. I'm not going to have to keep looking for God. I'm not going to have to keep calling out and saying, God, where are you? Where are you? If I call on the name of the Lord and I'm earnest and genuine in my faith, God is going to be found. We were in Ethiopia in 2007 we were going to see where some new churches had been started and in Ethiopia a paved road is a rarity so we're on this dirt track and it's way out in the country and it's very mountainous and we went to this thing in the morning where lots and lots of people had come to know the Lord. We had started several churches. And a guy came to us and he says, would you come with me? I want to show you where I've started a new church. So we went with him. Up on this mountain, and there's this fence, kind of like bamboo, just a grass fence, sectioning off this area, and there's this ginormous tree in the middle of it. And there's a hut in this area. And he says, come on in this this encampment, I want to show you what is going on in this area. And the people of this area, they worship this massive tree. I've never seen one that big before in my life. Well, when we're in there talking to the pastor, taking photos, the three of us and the pastor, we hear a bunch of noise back at the gate and we turn around and there are a bunch of angry people yelling at each other. And suddenly they burst through the gate and they came running at us and they all had machetes or sickles in their hands. And they had told our companions that were at the gate arguing with them, these men have come to take our land and to change our religion. Well, we had not come to take their land. Changing their religion, that's a different story. And they came right up to us 
and surrounded us as close as you and I are. And there's three of us. And I got to tell you, it was one of those moments in time where I was overwhelmed. I was outnumbered. I was outmatched. And I had no choice but to call on the Lord. And I can't explain what happened next, except that those guys just froze. I, I don't know. You ever played freeze tag? Yeah. It was kind of like that. And my friend and I just walked right through the middle and walked out of that compound. We called on the name of the Lord. And we found him. He was there. He saved us that day. And I can tell you a hundred other times when that's happened. And you have illustrations too in your own life where things were overwhelming to you. But if you seek the Lord, he will be found. And I love that verse 15. The last thing I want to share with you is that sometimes we forget. Anybody here? Anybody forget? Sure. How many of you didn't know where your keys were this morning? Okay, that's my, that's the thing I always forget. You know, something happens in our life. God helps us out, and we're so grateful until we forget about it. Uh, that's probably never happened to you, but as I get older... I forget more and more things, like where I keep my glasses, where I keep my keys, the name of my grandchildren are. No, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> but I do forget a lot of things. You're Mitchell. I know your name. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we forget how good the Lord has been to us. Sometimes we're just going on along in life and things are pretty decent. We're paying our bills. We've got food on the table. Everybody's reasonably healthy. And we just kind of forget. And that happened to Asa. Now, when the Ethiopians came, he had only been king a few years, maybe five, less than five years when the Ethiopians came against him, maybe a little longer. But it says in chapter 16 that when he was the king for 36 years, so this is 25, 26 years later, he forgot what the Lord had done because another enemy came against him. And instead of seeking the Lord, he went and offered a bribe to another kingdom to attack the enemy so that they would turn away from him and go that way. Asa forgot what the Lord had done for him. That happens sometimes. And it says in chapter 16, verse 8, Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and their vast army? The eyes of the Lord are watching. They search the whole earth to strengthen the people who are committed to him. And you've forgotten what I did for you. Don't forget. I call this a message for old guys and those who want to be old someday. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. I don't know what the Lord has done for you recently. Maybe, maybe you won Astros tickets. Maybe you had a loved one that survived a terrible disease. Maybe you got that job that you've been looking for. Or things are going right in your life for the first time in a long time. All I'm saying is don't forget what the Lord has done for you. Keep remembering Him. Keep seeking Him. Remember, if you do what is right, you will be rewarded. So everybody say it with me. Let's do the right thing. God bless you.